All right, welcome everybody um, to already lecture number seven in our series. Um, today I want to start with a little um, mentioning of a nice website. Remember that in lecture one, that was a long time ago, we talked about combinators. Um, and there's a very nice book that presents a lot of logic puzzles, all in terms of combinators. It's written by Raymond Smolian. I have the website here on the um, projector. And this is a quite old book, so I guess that you can get it secondhand or new um, quite cheaply. And the nice thing is what it does, it, it defines all kind of birds as combinators. So let's look at, you know, the um, the idiot bird, which is the identity uh, function, which you can define uh, in terms of the other combinators S and K. Um, and so you see that there's a lot of birds here that you know can all be defined using combinators. So if you want to have fun um, using combinators, I definitely um, recommend that you check out how to mock a mockingbird um, from the bookstore. Um, so let's continue now with our lecture and today's lecture is very appropriately about higher order functions. Um, combinators are higher order functions, functions that take other functions as arguments. Um, so today we're going to um, dive deep into those. Higher order functions, chapter 7. What is a higher order function? A higher order function sounds very inter or like expensive. It's like you know very uh, expensive word, but it really is nothing more than a function that takes a function as an argument or a function that returns another function as a result. And since in a functional language all your values are basically functions, that's what you would expect. Functions, if functions are first class values, that means that you can pass a function as an argument and that you can return a function as a result. And here's our good old friend, the twice function, that takes a function f and applies that function twice. Now the type of this function looks as follows. Twice is a function that takes a function from a to a, and if we write the type a little bit differently with extra parens, these are superfluous, now you see that twice is a function that takes a function from a to a and returns a new function from a to a. So by putting some extra parens, it becomes painfully obvious that twice is a higher order function. Uh, it's a double higher order function because it both returns a function and it takes a function as an argument. And as we all know, twice is um, defined as follows, twice of f of x equals f of f of x. And to remind you um, that we can write this even shorter, we can write twice of f equals f function composition with f itself. Um, sorry about that. Um, so that was our function twice. Why are higher order functions useful? Um, why are we making such a big deal out of them? First of all, and this is my main, um, the main reason that I love higher order functions, is that you can encode common programming idioms as higher order functions in the language itself. Um, and what do we mean by programming idioms? Things that you often find in other languages baked into the language. For example, loops or conditionals. Um, for example, in Haskell, you don't need any loops inside the language. You can define everything in terms of l normal functions. And that's a very powerful thing, because now the language itself, the core of the language can remain very small, and you just define all your other programming abstractions or idioms in terms of these um, lower level functions. The second thing is that you can de define domain-specific languages as collections of higher order functions. Domain-specific languages are one of the, the like fads these days. Everybody seems to be talking about domain-specific languages. In Haskell, it's not such a big deal. 
because Haskell, you can view Haskell as um, executable denotational semantics. Um, one of my other many favorite books is Dave Smeet's book on denotational semantics. And if you look at denotational semantics, really what you're doing is you're defining an interpreter for a language in a functional language. Uh, for example, if we define, and we'll, we'll see this later when we define, when we talk about algebraic data types, um, when you define the type of expressions as follows, so an expression is either um, a um, value of type int, or, and we're doing really simple expressions, is the addition of two other expressions. So this um, algebraic data declaration here defines the abstract syntax of a language, a programming language that has expressions like um, one plus two plus three. Very simple expressions like this. Now, if you define an interpreter for this language based on the abstract syntax, what you do is you, you write a function eval that has a following type. It takes an expression and it returns an int in this case. So in this way, you can define a domain-specific language by defining an interpreter for your language inside Haskell itself. And in many cases, instead of having this kind of simple evaluation function that goes from expression to int, you will use a lot of higher order functions. And the third reason that Haskell programmers and functional programmers in general love higher order functions is that you can use their algebraic properties to reason about programs, to derive programs, to manipulate programs. And this is something that you've seen in previous lectures where we define functions and then we start reasoning about them using equational reasoning by substituting definitions um, for the right hand sides, etc. And higher order functions make that often a lot easier because you can abstract from certain patterns by means of higher order functions and then you use the properties of these higher order functions such that you don't have to reason about the lower level details. So higher order functions are a very nice way to raise the level of abstraction. Let's look at another higher order function, one of our other favorites, the map function. What does map again? Well, it takes a list and a function and it returns a new list where you apply that function to each element of the list. For example, if you uh, type into Hux or GHCI, um, we've seen on the forums um, a lot of um, kind of hints on how to um, use uh, GHCI or Hux. Um, so by now, I hope you're all comfortable doing that. If you type into Hux um, or GHCI, whatever, in the REPL loop, you type in map of um, plus one of the list 1357, you will apply the function plus one to each element of the list. So what you get is two, four, six, eight. And here I want to remind you that this weird notation of um, plus one is what we called sectioning in a previous lecture. So this thing is the same as lambda x um, x plus one. Okay, so this is the function that um, increments its argument by one. We can write it very concisely using the sectioning notation like that. There's two, way we, two ways we can define the map function. The first one is with uh, list comprehensions. So uh, that one looks quite simple. It says, give me all the values f of x where x is drawn from x's. So to map a function f over a list x's, you just take all the elements out of the list, that's the generator on the right hand side there of that bar, and then I apply the function to it and then return that as a list. For purposes of proofs and in order to reason about your code, it's often easier to define map recursively. But these definitions are exactly equivalent. It's just that for one purpose, one is handier. Uh, for other purposes, the previous one is handier. To define lists um, using recursion, we do the usual thing of defining it by induction over the structure of the list. If the list is empty, 
then mapping a function over that list is the empty list. There's no elements in the list, so there's nothing we can do. If the list starts with x and the rest is x's, then the result of mapping f over each element of the list is applying f to the first element and then mapping f to the rest of the list. So you see that if you like the terminology, I'm not a big fan of it, but the first definition of map looks more declarative. You're, you don't really specify the order in which you apply that function f. You just say for each element x in the list, apply the function. In the one below, you're really specifying that you're walking through this list from left to right, peeling off each element and applying the function as you go. Let's look at another higher order function, uh, our good friend filter. Filter takes a list and a predicate, a function from the type of the list to bool, and returns a new list, only keeping the elements in the list for which that predicate returns true. For example, if we apply filter of even to the list of numbers between 1 to 10, we get only the even numbers, obviously 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10. Let's look at how we can define filter. Just like map, we can define filter in two ways. One with a list comprehension, that's the top definition. So to filter x's with a predicate p, we draw all the elements out of the list, let's call them x, and only if the predicate holds, we're keeping that x and we're just returning them. So we're not applying any function, we're just dropping out all the elements for which the predicate does not hold. Similarly, as with map, we can define filter with induction and recursion. If we want to filter the elements that satisfy predicate from an empty list, well, the only thing we can do is return the empty list. If we want to filter out the elements that satisfy p from a list that starts with x, we have two choices. First of all, p of x is true, in which case we keep the element and we um, append that to filtering the rest of the list. And if p of x is not true, that's the otherwise case, we just drop x on the floor and only return the filtering the remainder of the list. So you see, this one again is a little bit more operational where we show how we run through this list from left to right, peeling off each element, checking if the predicate holds, and if it holds, we just cons it on top and otherwise we throw it away. Now if you look at these two functions, you see that they have a very similar structure. They have an extremely similar structure and functional programmers, I think, invented this notion of don't repeat yourself. Whenever a, really f a real functional programmer sees something twice or three times, their hands start to itch because that's repetition, which means an opportunity to define a higher order function. And the same in this case, if you look at these two examples that we've shown, they both follow this pattern. You define something for the empty list, so if I um, apply function f to the empty list, it returns some value v. And if I apply it to a list that contains, it starts with x and a remainder x's, what I do is I recursively apply f to x's, to the rest of the list, I take the first element and I combine it with this operator plus to yield the result. So here you see this is the essence of defining a function f over a list using recursion. That's exactly what you do. Now let's see if we can take this scheme and define that as a higher order function. And before we do that, let's look at a couple of more examples. If I want to sum a list, it starts to get boring. The empty list goes to zero and otherwise I take the first element of the list and add that to the sum of the rest of the list. To um, multiply all the elements of a list, we start with the empty list that returns 1 and otherwise we take the first element of the list and multiply that with the product of the remainder of the list. So in that case, the value v for the empty list is 1 and the operator that we use to combine the recursive call with the first with the head of the list is multiplication. 
Um, another one is AND, um, which ANDs all the elements of a Boolean list. If I start with the empty list, I return true. If I start with a list um, that has x, x and x's, I take x and I AND that with the result of ANDing the remainder of the list. And in that case, it should now be obvious that the value for the empty list is true and the operator that we use to combine the recursive call with the head of the list is AND. Here you see that we now have already seen five functions over lists that all follow the same pattern. Now what is this pattern? Well, we have a higher order function called folder, which means fold right, it folds from left to right, it's like the wind, you know, it's, it goes, you know, um, to the right and it encapsulates this pattern that we see over and over again. So for example, to define sum, we say, well, we fold right this list from left to right with zero for the empty list and plus to combine the head of the list with the result of recursively calling the rest of the list. Um, or is another one where we just fold the list with or, and is the another one, and uh, product, we just, the empty list is one, and if we have a non-empty list, we combine that by taking the head, multiplying that with the result of the recursive call. This higher order function captures all that boring code. Don't repeat yourself, only define this thing once. If you want to show, if you want to do a recursive um, computation over a list, you don't write out a recursion, you write this higher order function fold r once and then you just call that with these uh, values for v and plus. How is fold defined itself? Well, fold itself is defined using recursion. And here's the definition, um, just as we explained uh, before, to fold uh, the empty list, you return that value v. And to fold a non-empty list, well, I recursively fold the rest of the list and then I apply my function f here that, we, that was called before this kind of strange plus, I apply f to the head of the list and that recursive call. Now, while this um, definition is defined using recursion, it's easier to imagine how um, fold works in a non-recursive way. Um, remember that if you write a list with uh, square brackets, a list one, two, three, it really means a composition of the cons operator. And what a fold really does, a fold R, it, it replaces every cons operation with F and every empty list with V. That's, um, so that's a non-operational uh, way of looking at the list. So sometimes people write a fold as follows. If I have a list x's, you can write here cons is replaced by f and the empty list is replaced by v. Um, so this is the way to, and now I have to be precise here, this is another way to look at folder. Instead of saying, oh, how does this work recursively, you just say, in this list here, everywhere where you see this, replace it by f and everywhere where you see the empty list, replace it by v. When you look at it this way, you see that this fold is very much like kind of a visitor that you write in object-oriented programming, where you're, where you're traversing a um, structure and for each subtype, in this case each constructor, you're calling a specific function. Um, and um, Jeremy Gibbons has written a very beautiful paper, if you search for that, um, where he makes that precise, how the visitor pattern looks like in functional programming. But for, more, for all practical purposes we can say that fold is like a visitor, it goes through this type for every constructor, which as we've seen corresponds to a subtype, it will apply a, a certain function. So here is how you visualize uh, this non-recursive version of fault, this more declarative way of looking at fault. We again unfold the definition, so sum of one to three, one to three, 
Well, sum was defined as fold of one of plus and zero applied to that list. As we know, the square bracket list notation just means one cons two cons three cons empty list. Now we apply this rule and we replace everywhere where we see cons, we replace it by plus and everywhere where we see the empty list, we replace that by zero. So let's do that. And what we get is the sum one, two, three, four with pluses in between. And if you do a little bit of arithmetic, that returns six. But the main step here is in, in this step here that's um, highlighted by that balloon. What fold does, it just replaces every constructor in the list by uh, plus and the empty list by zero. So it visits the list and, and does its work. Now let's look at another example, product. Again, product is defined as fold r of times and one. Right, so we unfold the definition of product, then we unfold the definition of list notation in terms of cons and empty list, and now we apply the uh, definition of fold, replace every occurrence of cons with multiplication and every occurrence of the empty list by one. We get uh, this. Since we know that one is a neutral element, this is really one times two times three. And guess what? We get six as well. Let's look at some other examples. You think that, oh, you know, we've shown you all these kind of simple examples like product and sum. They're all very similar where you're running through this list and you're, you're really using every element and applying some operation on it. If you look at length, that might be not so obvious that you can define length using folder as well. So let's look at length defined recursively. Length takes a list and returns an int. How does it do that? Well, it takes um, the empty list, maps that to zero. When you have a non-empty list, you recursively calculate the length of the tail of the list and you add one to it. In this case, we're not really using the head of the list. That's why it's um, written using an underscore. You might think, ah, this doesn't really follow the pattern of a fault because the pattern of a fault took a plus function that took the head of the list and the, the, the recursive call, where here we can, instead of using the head of the list, we're uh, just using one. Well, let's look at the, the recursive call and maybe that gives us some inspiration. Length of one to three is the length of one cons two cons three cons empty list. And what this recursive function does, it says, well, I replace, um, I put once everywhere in the recursive call. That's what we've seen. So now the result of, of calculating uh, length is one plus one plus one plus zero. And now you apply this rule here in the opposite direction because we have to synthesize a function f. We already know from here what it does for the empty list. For the empty list it's zero, so we know already what v is. But we now have to figure out what function we use for cons. Well, in this case, what we want to do is we need a function that takes the, he the head of the list and the result of the recursive call, and in this case should take the result of the recursive call and add one to it. All right. So if we synthesize that, we see that if we take as the function here lambda, whatever the first argument is, and n, and just add one to it, then we're fine. So we can define length as the following version of fault. We pass it a function, it must be a function of two parameters, that just throw away its, throws away its first argument and adds one to the recursive call. So even a function as length can be written as a fault. Another interesting way to define length is to define it using the composition of a map and a sum. Um, so 
I can define length as follows. I can say, well, it's the sum composed with map of lambda unit arrow one. So what this says is replace all the elements in the list by one and then sum that list. Again, if you look at, I'm sorry that I'm going back. If you look at the, oh, I'm all messing around. I shouldn't have gone back. If you, if you look at um, this uh, example here, what, uh, what I've done is you look at here, you say one plus one plus zero. Um, so I've, I've just summing up, I, I just replace everything by one. That's what you see here, one plus one plus one. And then I, I use sum. Um, so that's another way to define length. Now what you can do as homework is to prove that this version of length and this version of length are exactly the same. And this is um, something that we often use when you have two functions defined as a fault you can fuse them. This is what we call fusion. So there's here an intermediate structure. You take a list, you replace every element by one, I get a new list, and then I sum it. That's kind of a waste because now I'm creating new elements here in between, even though it's lazy, so I'm not creating that list eagerly, but still I have to allocate each con cell here when I do the map. And this one is obviously more efficient. But you can show that I can fuse this thing and get this function here. And, and so that's uh, an interesting an exercise. And in a later lecture, we will go deeper into calculating the definition of length like this from this specification. You, you can argue that this um, way of specifying map is clear because here we needed to, to do this trick of, of inventing the function we pass to folder, whereas here it's kind of clear, just, you know, it's like the way um, small children um, count, you know, just by putting um, numbers, you know, this is like counting, I don't know how that's called, you know, if you count like this, that's kind of, you know, how you uh, calculate the sum in that way. All right, so that was length. Um, let's look at another one. Um, reverse. Um, reverse a list. Uh, the empty list goes to the empty list. And to reverse um, a list of head x and tail x's, what do we do? Well, we reverse the list and then we stick x at the end. Um, let's run that again. I call reverse on one, uh, two, three. That means reverse of one, cons two, cons three, cons empty list. And if I um, apply the definition of reverse and I apply the number of times um, for each cons used on, uh, based on that uh, definition uh, on the top line, I get the following expression. And if you stare at this for a while, you see that you can define this using a fault as well. Because what have I done? Well, if you look um, at this step between the second and the third line, what we have done is we've replaced the empty list by the empty list and we, we, we have replaced cons by x's append x. So even reverse can be defined using a fault. And again, this one requires a little bit of thinking, but often it helps to write down a little example like this look at um, how it unfolds and use, I probably shouldn't have wiped it out, uh, but use this property that fold R of F and V applied to a list X's is the same as X's where I replace cons by F and the empty list by, by a V. And in order to write a function as a fault, the trick or the technique, it's not a trick, it's a technique that I often use is I uh, 
expand axis and then I look at that expansion to see what the cons has been replaced with and then I can find the F and this is one is usually obvious where you can find what the empty list is replaced with. And that is what we're doing in this example. We're writing out reverse of X's and then we can say, ah, now I know what that F should be because I recognize the pattern. Um, so that's the kind of technique. So if you, if you do this often enough, it will become second nature and you can write every function that you want, um, nearly every function you want on a list um, using a fault. Um, Graham has a, a, a very nice paper that shows what is the expressive power of fault. I can um, recommend that to you too. If you really want to go deep, there, there are interesting papers, uh, well, old papers that I wrote, that Lambert Meertens wrote about other recursion schemes that are a little bit more powerful where you can also use the list itself instead of only the recursive call and the hat. And these functions all have nice um, Greek names. So fault um, is called a catamorphism and there's like hylomorphisms and paramorphisms. It's the whole zoo of uh, morphisms that you can do, but all of them encode basically recursion patterns over recursive data structures, all kind of variations of the visitor pattern. So here's how we define um, reverse. Now here's another nice one that's uh, at the bottom of the slide. Is you can even define the append function concatenation between um, two lists as a fault. Really, if you think about it, what do you do when you concatenate two lists? When I want to concatenate x's with y's, well, what do I do is if I look at x's, that is like, you know, x0, cons, x1, cons, empty list. In order to append the two, I need to replace the empty list by y's. And that's exactly what we say here, so you, re you uh, replace cons by cons and then you replace the um, empty list by y. So in a, and then um, the definition here, I think, let me write it down um, clearly. On the slide I would write x's concatenated with y's equals fold r of cons y's x's, that's the long definition and if you're a real functional programmer you say well really this x's plays no role so you write this as, remove this. So we all know that you could put parents around the binary operator and write it as a function. So this is the same. And now I can remove that guy from both sides and now I can define y's equals foldar cons y's and now we know we use sectioning and we can say this is the same as y's. So there's a little bit of implicit reasoning here um, to define it like this. Here's an interesting exercise that you can do at home. Really this y's here is also um, not very useful. So in this case you can even kind of, you know, remove it here and you define um, concatenation like this. So this is even a shorter version. So this is what uh, Haskell people like, is no repetition and no unnecessary noise. Um, and this kind of, what well, is called add a reduction, is very hard to do in, in a language like C-sharp where you have to write functions with all their arguments. If you would define concatenation, you know, you, you define it like, you know, concatenation of x's and y's. It's really hard to, to define the same function with only one argument or zero arguments. Um, but in Haskell it's optimized for that. All right. So to, to uh, re, uh, repeat, why is fold, uh, fold R useful? Well, a lot of recursive functions over lists 
are very simple to define using foldar, which means that you don't have to repeat yourself. You don't write a recursion. You define that once. You write one recursive function, the definition of foldar. You don't even write it. It's the Haskell library writers have written it, and maybe they even have a more efficient way to do it. Um, maybe they run it in parallel, and then you can define your function on top of that. Other properties that um, you get from writing it as folder is what I said here, is that I can define now, I can use things here that have functional programmers like exotic names. So there's something called the banana split rule. Um, uh, just go and look up what that means. We'll talk about that later. But we like fancy names like this or fusion. And fusion was this thing where I take the sum I compose that with map of one, and what I get is I can see that this is fold R of plus n. Oh, sorry, fold R of lambda unit x one plus x zero. So you can prove if you define this. Using fusion, you can show that this composition of these two functions is the same as this function. And that's why it's called fusion. You take these two functions and you fuse them into one function. Now let me drill this down even more. The reason that you can write this is because Haskell is lazy. In a lazy language, I can do this because this guy won't generate an intermediate data structure here. It will do it lazily enough. So, so if you apply map, it doesn't really do anything. And only if you sum it, it will evaluate just enough, driven by the fact that sum is defined using pattern matching to create that list. But you're not creating, suppose you have a list of a thousand elements, you're not creating all these thousand elements at once as an immediate list. If you have a strict language, um, or if, like for example, if you would do this in C sharp with arrays instead of enumerables, when you and map, by the way, select in C sharp, in that case you would have an intermediate value that would take up, you know, um, a lot of memory that you immediately throw away when you do the sum. So in strict languages, you often see that people immediately define their functions in this way because this one is too inefficient. What you do in Haskell, you define it in the most simple way, and then you look and maybe it, you know, it doesn't really matter. You, there's no need to write it in this more efficient way. Um, but there's a choice. Whereas in, an, in a strict language, you cannot do that because this one will then always generate an intermediate value. Um, and that's what the third point says, is that you can apply a lot of advanced program optimizations like you know, banana split and fusion um, when you use fold R instead of recursion. Um, now this is not completely true because a lot of these things you can also um, prove using induction, uh, recursion induction. So instead of do, proving this um, using induction over the list, you can use fixed point induction. Uh, fixed point induction, maybe in the end um, of the lecture series I will insert um, a special lecture where I will explain uh, various reasoning principles for uh, functional programs. But uh, fixed point induction is, is one of my favorite uh, rules because that allows you to, to reason about arbitrary recursive functions. Um, and you don't have to look at functions that are defined uh, using induction over the list like sum and map. Um, and in many cases, when you have a recursive function, it's, it's handier to just use the big hammer of a fixed point induction. Uh, okay, let's look at some other um, higher order library functions. Uh, we've seen function composition a couple of times. Uh, function composition, that's the prototype, uh, prototypical uh, higher order function. It takes a function from B to C and a function from A to B, and it returns a function from A to C. So from this type, you, it might cause a little bit of, um, like, dazzle you. But if you, if you think about it, 
it's not that strange. Um, if you read that type from right to left, um, what you get out of this is a function that takes an A. So what do you do with that? Well, you pass that to the second function, G, that returns a B, and then you pass that result to the first function, which takes a B and returns a C, and then the result of that is C. So just by looking at the type, again, of the composition, there's really only one way you can define this. And that is the beauty of having a, a very precise type system like Haskell, is you look at the types and the implementation follows more or less automatically. Um, and how do you use um, function composition? That is often used, as I've shown before, for twice, it's often used to eliminate additional arguments. For example, if I want to define the function odd that takes an integer to a boolean and checks whether it's odd, I define odd as the composition of even and not. Instead of writing um, odd of x equals not even x. And this is the same as not compose even of x. And so this x here is not necessary. This is something that people in Haskell do a lot. R this is called point-free notation. You write this thing with as few variables as possible. Why do you do that? Because this um, form makes it much easier to reason about your programs algebraically. And again, that's something that we will see in, in later lectures as well. Um, some more higher order functions. Um, all takes a predicate and a list and returns a bool whether every element in this list satisfies the predicate. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we map the predicate p over the list, written here using a list comprehension, and then we apply the end function. Again, since this function is defined as the composition of a map, that is the first thing, and a fault, you can write this thing as a fault. That's a very easy thing to um, convince yourself of. If I have a map followed by a fault, fold R, I can write that directly as a fold R. So you could eliminate the intermediate structure here and give a slightly more complicated but more efficient definition of AND that doesn't build an intermediate value. Same here for any, it maps the predicate over the list and then um, calls OR on it. So if I check whether um, there is white space in this string, it will return true because the, you see there between the C and the D is a little uh, space. Here's another interesting function, take while. Um, if you look at the link standard sequence operators, you will, uh, by the way, recognize a lot of these uh, functions here. Take while takes a list and picks off the, the first elements of the list as long as this predicate P is true. Um, and you see here, it can be defined using recursion. So if I take the empty list, well, that's the empty list, and otherwise I um, take um, x on top of x's if P holds, and if it doesn't hold, I, I, I stop. Um, I think there's an exercise to show how you can write this with fold R as well, um, but again you see, you start recognizing, yeah, there's this recursion pattern, I probably can, can write this as a fault. Um, the opposite of take while is drop while, so it just, um, instead of retaining the values until the predicate is true, it drops them, um, and again, um, the difference is only um, in the last case there, so if I want to drop while uh, is space, it just removes all the leading spaces um, and then returns the rest of the list. So here uh, again, um, a couple of exercises. Um, the one that I was uh, expecting is not here, um, but just go through the standard library, I would say add to like a fourth exercise here. Um, go to the standard library and see how many of these functions 
you can define using a foldar. Um, and the other thing is if you're adventurous, try to prove that if you have a map composed with a foldar, you can write that as a foldar itself. Um, thank you very much. This was lecture seven. I want to remind you, um, if you want to buy a book, you should do this before December 31st because that's when the discount um, runs out. I hope you um, will do your homework, be active on the forums. It's amazing to see how many people there are and how people on the forum help each other. It's fantastic to see like everybody is everybody's TA. Um, I couldn't wish for, for anything more. Thank you very much and see you next week for lecture eight.